Hello, and welcome back to Hemophyte Breakdowns. Today, I want to talk about the one-handed attack. That'd be a cut or a thrust. So, uh, one-handed cuts and thrusts in longsword are generally looked down upon, and for, I think, two good reasons. The first is that they're generally seen as a little sporty, non-committal. Um, oftentimes they end up just sort of touching you on the hand or touching you on the shoulder, touching you on the head, and it never feels like they would do all that much damage. And it usually just feels like you're trying to just kind of play sword tag. And the other reason that people hate them is that when you miss them, or even oftentimes when you land them, the only recourse for the person who's just thrown it is to run away as fast as they can, because the only counter that you usually see is you got hit and then you're immediately trying to go for that afterblow if your system has afterblows. So you, basically what happens is you almost get this kind of wily coyote situation where someone throws a one-handed cut, they gently touch the other person, uh, touch the other person somewhere, and then suddenly they're just trying to chase them down. And it, it looks dumb. It doesn't feel great. It's kind of silly. <clears throat> but I feel like most of the time the reason for that is that people don't really know what to do about one-handed attacks and specifically people don't really know how to throw one-handed attacks. So the first thing we're going to go over is how to throw them. Also partially because I believe that if you want to counter something, the first thing you need to know is what exactly is going through your opponent's head when they're trying to throw it. So as is pretty obvious, one-handed attacks uh, benefit primarily from range and the ability to land an attack with a longer than understood range so that you can then run away. So we're going to watch this exchange and we're going to watch how uh, this person who throws the one-handed attack uses their range. So as you can see by watching this, it's a pretty simple exchange, but there's a couple things to go over. The first is the hand and the foot. Whenever you're delivering a one-handed attack, I would say pretty much every single time you should be using your non-dominant hand. And the reason for this is that most long swords have a grip between eight and 10 inches. The whole reason that you use your non-dominant hand is because your non-dominant hand is on the bottom of the grip of your sword, which means when you're at full extension, you've gained six, eight, 10, sometimes more inches on your thrust or your cut. It's giving you extra range. And given that in a one-handed cut, range is really all you get. Every little inch matters even more than normal. For the exact same reason, you want to have your non-dominant foot forward. So the reason for this is that if you look at where this thrust would have pretty much landed, their hand is not very far past their foot. That's because uh, in order to extend with the hip and with the shoulder and with the arm, they have to turn against their hip, which means that they can't really rotate more than 90, maybe 100 degrees towards their right. If their left leg was forward, they'd be rotating in the opposite direction, meaning that as they threw their left shoulder forward and their left arm forward, they could also rotate their hip and their shoulder to 90 degrees facing this way, and they'd gain two, three more inches. They could go to a full flat T-pose right here, and they would be at their maximum extension with their left arm. Their right leg wouldn't be forward. Their left leg probably wouldn't even have to be forward. And they could have done this entire thing, who knows how far back, maybe even half a foot. That right there is what's going to make that successful. <clears throat> but if we want to talk about countering this attack, the first thing we're going to have to talk about is what a person who wants to throw a one-handed attack looks for in their opponent. And what I would say is nine times out of ten, whether you're talking about the guy sling or a one-handed arm cut or a one-handed stab, the first thing you want to look for is a person who's just standing there in a guard, generally a guard with their tip offline. So we're talking Vomtog, Fool, maybe even, um, you know, Boar's Tooth, something like that. The basic idea is that if someone is standing in front of you and they're within range of your one-handed attack, and they're not actively moving forward or backward, if they're not actively attacking you, then a, your attack is not going to be instantly countered. If you want to imagine two people are walking at each other, if you throw a one-handed attack and they walk into it, yeah, they walked into it, and then they're immediately going to be in range to hit you back. If, depending on the rules of your, uh, of your particular fight and your particular tournament, 
they might end up with more points than you did. But so basically what this means is that defensiveness or a kind of passivity is what other people are going to be looking for. The next thing is that you're exposed targets. When your blade is up in the air like this in a Vomtog, which is where a lot of people stand, your present threat is that Oberhau straight to their head. But if you're just standing there and you're not throwing an Oberhau, there is no present threat. At the very least, when your tip is forward towards another person, um, you could take a step forward and stab them. You have to do two things in order to hit them with an Oberhau. And that's not inherently bad. But what it does mean is that when you throw your one-handed attack, whether it be at the arm or the face or the leg, they have to do one of two things. They either have to get out of the way, which is hard because of the extra range, or they have to parry it, which is hard because you're in a position where you have to cross your entire body line in order to parry. Or if it's at the leg, you just can't parry it at all. Then after you've either gotten out of the way or parried, you have to then try to go back in and hit them. All of that's very, very hard to do. So what I would say is there are two things that you want to be doing in order to prevent people from throwing those one-handed strikes at you. The first is to keep a good aggression. That doesn't necessarily mean you're always charging at them. But what it means is that when you're entering into a range in which you can attack, you are attacking. If you're going to play the zoo fecting game or the pre-fencing game and you're outside of range, you want to be outside of the range of a one-handed attack. That means you have to back up another 6, 10 inches further than you maybe think. A two-handed attack has a rather limited range and a one-handed attack is about a foot, maybe more longer than that. So if you want to be safe and you want to be outside of the engagement, back up. But if you don't mind being in the pocket and you shouldn't mind being in the pocket, what you have to be aware of is that the second you enter your range, you have to be going. You either have to be fainting, you have to be attacking, you have to be moving your feet, you have to be doing something because that passivity is exactly what's going to cue somebody else into the idea that you're a free target. The next thing we're going to talk about is what's best to parry one-handed attacks. And I would say that any guard with your point forward is best because of the limited amount of space that you have to properly parry anything. So if we watch this exchange again and we see how far this blade has to travel to parry, it's quite a lot. I would honestly say that it was almost luck that caused this thrust to miss. It really looked like because of how they rolled their hand here when they were throwing their thrust, it caused the path of the blade to go like this and kind of uh, make a C in the air and go over the shoulder rather than into the neck. But either way, this parry was very, very long. If they started off in this position, all it takes to parry a one-handed thrust or a one-handed cut to the arms or the head or whatever is just a little inch. Because there's only one hand on the sword, there is absolutely zero structure to it. The, the tiniest little tap of this blade will send it careening off into nowhere. And it's at that point that you have a completely open target to throw your riposte and throw your afterblow. So if there are... Two things that you should be doing to prevent one-handed cuts, it's being conscious of your distance, either being outside completely of a one-handed attack, or be attacking or doing something once you're inside that range. And the second thing is have a point forward guard. If you do both of these things, you're going to find that you're going to be getting hit by these one-handed cuts way less. And more importantly, you're going to be landing those after blows way more. Combine the two, and you're going to find pretty quickly that, again, depending on the rule set, people who throw a lot of one-handed attacks are going to be much less successful. All right, that's going to be it for today. If you'd like to see your own uh, footage featured on the channel, feel free to send me an email at hemophytebreakdowns at gmail.com. Thanks, and hope to see you next time.